I mentioned this story uh, that uh, the Dartmouth men's basketball team has voted to unionize. And I, you know, we always try to push a story forward. Like, what's it mean? Like, what's the real fallout that this could mean for sports? And not necessarily football and basketball, but maybe the, uh, you know, smaller sports, the uh, ones that don't produce revenue here. Ross Dellinger does a great job covering college uh, sports, certainly college football, Yahoo Sports senior writer. All right, help me understand, help the audience understand, what does this mean that Dartmouth is trying to unionize or going to try to unionize? What's it mean for college sports? Uh, Yes, uh, everybody wants to know, right? How does this impact all other college programs? Dan, it's, it's, it could be a while till we know. Um, you know, right now there's an appeal uh, from Dartmouth. It's an appeals process to the the National Labor Relations Board National Office in Washington D.C. And if the appeal is upheld there, it'll probably be further appealed to federal courts, and then from there, Dan could go to the Supreme Court. Uh, so it could be a while before we have some finality. In the meantime, the fact that a local NLRB region office deemed Dartmouth men's basketball players employees it is somewhat historic and could have ramifications in the way that other players at other programs, certainly programs that make more money, right, than the Dartmouth men's basketball team, which loses hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, those players could see what Dartmouth did, right, and they could do it themselves, right? They could get together themselves and unionize collectively. So that is certainly maybe in the immediate what we could see is more movement in college programs like this but as far as some kind of like national edict of players or employees it could be a while that until we see that from the courts because this is going to be pushed further and further and further further away like maurice claret was trying to come out and by the time that was going to be heard he was going to already be in the nfl uh, Northwestern, when they tried to unionize. So I don't know if Dartmouth is saying, look, this isn't going to affect us, but it could affect generations of college athletics, college athletes here. And what do you get if you would happen to be unionized in college athletics? Well, you conceivably, you'd get uh, collective bargaining, uh, right? So as a union, as a group of players, you would be able to bargain with your school, the employer, potentially, uh, you know, according to the ruling uh, at the Boston NLRB office. So you could collectively bargain. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders, Dan, in college athletics, whether it be uh, coaches, even administrators, maybe even some commissioners have come out publicly saying that the the fix to all of this, right, all of the problem that college football and basketball specifically are having, the money issue is to collectively bargain with some kind of players association. And that's what we're heading around down, right? It, it's a path toward uh, a, a school or a conference or even a national organization like the NCAA bargaining compensation in terms and benefits with a group of athletes. Uh, you know, college football and basketball to an extent, but especially major college football has become such a big money maker uh, that we're we're in this position where uh, you're gonna have you're gonna start having unions or players associations for players to get direct compensation. And I think a lot of people, even when in, like I said, college athletics thinks that's kind of the answer. Okay, but this is Dartmouth. I don't believe they give scholarships. Like I'm, I'm just curious that that it's Dartmouth. It's a private school. It's Ivy League. It's not revenue producing why Dartmouth yeah great question and it, it's it's interesting because the appeal from Dartmouth I uh, was reading through the documents of the appeal and one of the things they argue is of all the places that you would choose to make employees you 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 choose uh, us you know obviously the players got together and did this there but but they are uh probably not a great example uh, of a athletic department in a a team that should be deemed employees, right? They they lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe upwards of a million every year. The basketball, men's basketball team there does, just like a lot of men, men's basketball teams, especially in the Ivy League. They don't offer scholarships, like you said. In their appeal, at least, they say that there are no real extra benefits. There are no academic 
type of uh, concessions made for for the enrollment of, of basketball players. So why us is kind of what they argued in the appeal, and they they certainly have have a point, right? You can point to the Michigan football team, the Duke basketball team, right, and, and say why aren't those groups named employees? Why would you why would you deem our our group employees, we don't check off a lot of the employment boxes. But what what the Dartmouth men's basketball team in the union argued is that Dartmouth athletic department and coaches have, quote, control over the men's basketball team and the athletes. They set the schedules. They penalize players for not showing up. They demand you be at practice. That's kind of what they use. But, Dan, to back to your point, if the Dartmouth men's basketball team was deemed employees as they were and as they might by the national board in the courts, then every college team in the country probably could be deemed employees. Well, then if you're an employee, now I'm going to make sure that you put basketball ahead of academics because that's going to be important for me. Like you're not a student. You know, you're an, you're an employee and you're employed because you're a good basketball player. So I, I, I don't know. There, there's a lot to work out here. Um, a lot of gray area. It's, it is. It's, it's really it's complex. It's a complicated issue. It's challenging kind of to get your, your mind around it. But I think the gist is college athletics as, quote, amateurs right now, even though we all know right through NIL, they're, they're getting a lot. They're getting a decent amount of, of money, especially at the highest level from booster collectives. But in the way they're still considered amateur athletes and they're they're getting quite a bit of benefits because of that whether that's the training table the dining hall you name it you know com, uh, for private flights to games things like that they are getting a lot of benefits and you wonder Dan when they all are quote employees if if when that does happen those benefits how many of them will go away and then you start talking about, as you mentioned off the top, the Olympic sports. What happens to the Olympic sports programs at these schools that don't make revenue, a lot of revenue, and certainly don't turn a profit at all, kind of like Dartmouth men's basketball? How does Dartmouth, right, how do they pay athletes on their on their, on a team that loses whatever, $500,000, $800,000 uh, a year? Where do they come up with the funds to do it? A lot of administrators are asking the same thing when it comes to the Olympic sports at these power programs that uh, rely on football profit and men's basketball profit to subsidize them. Uh, so that's a that's certainly a key issue. The the one thing athlete advocates will say, right, is, well, you can cut the coach's salary, football coach and basketball coach's salaries, and then you can pay your Olympic sports. <laughs> Good to talk to you, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Ross Dellinger, Yahoo Sports senior writer covering college football.